Hello, I'm Howie Sheriff, and welcome to another show from You Call This Yoga on our internet TV discussion with leaders of accessible yoga from around our country and soon the world. Today we have the privilege of having Lee Albert, a neuromuscular therapist and author of Yoga for Pain Relief. Lee has been exploring realms of comfort for folks for quite a while through his journey personally and professionally. That's something I can relate to also as I've had my traumas and intentions to utilize those to benefit others. Our show is an interactive show where we hope that viewers and listeners will consider calling in and engaging our host occasionally and our guest significantly. Our phone number is 919-518-9773. You can Skype at Computers 2K Voice, and you can enter the chat by logging into the box on your NissanCommunications.com webpage with logging in and sending us a message. We'll look to get to you as soon as we can and hopefully clarify some of your issues. Speaking of issues, I'll invite you all to consider checking your posture now, setting your feet down to the floor, getting your body a little more aligned because we're going on a wonderful ride with Lee Albert. Good morning, Lee. Good morning, Howie. Thank you for joining us. Where are you uh, situated right now besides in a room? I am in Pittsfield, Massachusetts on a uh, relatively cold and overcast day. Hmm. In the 30s this morning. Ah, so that would invite wanting to sort of huddle over a little bit, potentially. Potentially, that is true. But I'm sure we're going to warm things up this morning. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, tell us a little, Lee, what inspired you? What was your early orientation about pain? How, how did you come upon this topic? Yes, well, this happened about 30 years ago, Howie. I was a, I went to massage school. I was a brand new massage therapist. And that that very summer, I was driving on, on vacation up in Canada when I came to a stop sign, and the guy behind me did not come to a stop sign. He hit me going 60 miles an hour. He was fooling around with the kid in the back seat, didn't see traffic stop, and rear-ended me. He never touched the brake. Remarkably, even though the accident was very severe, I had nothing broken and nothing bleeding. And, the car, and the, even though the car was a mangled mess, I was actually able to get out of the car without any equipment prying it open. And I was actually fine, except for being you know, quite shaken up. So I thought I dodged the bullet. But what happened is about three or four weeks later, and now that I'm a therapist, I understand this, this process, I started to get headaches. And I not only started to get headaches, I started to get migraine headaches. Mm. Now, I had never had a migraine before in my life. And for those listeners who don't know what a migraine is, it's a headache on steroids. And you really wouldn't wish it on anybody. You know, sometimes those headaches could last for two or three days as well. And, it was sometimes it's really hard to function. So fortunately for me, I had just landed a job as a brand new massage therapist at a physical therapy clinic doing massage on some of their clients. And of course, who knows the body better than physical therapists when it comes to this sort of injury? So since we're, I now work there, they're going to treat me way and above and beyond what the insurance is going to cover. So lucky me. So they actually treated me about twice a week, I'm going to say, for the next six or seven months. 
unfortunately were not able to resolve my migraines. Now, sometimes they'd be able to take it away for a week or two, but it didn't seem like they could come with, with anything that would last. So after that six or seven months, they said, you know what, we're kind of out of tricks here. We don't know what else to try. You better start trying other modalities. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to try anything I can think of because I'm desperate to get rid of these migraines. And of course, this is going to be out of pocket money now. So, you know, chiropractic and deep tissue and structural integration, acupuncture, acupressure. I mean, you name it, you know, I was going to, I'm, I'm doing it. And I would do two to three sessions a week. And I would only seek out the best practitioners, which of course meant the most expensive practitioners. But I really didn't care. As long as I get rid of my migraines, I would spend every last dime that I had. So I did that for another six, seven, eight months. Unfortunately, my migraines were still not resolved at that point. I figured I was out somewhere around eight or nine thousand dollars, which would have been absolutely fine if my migraines were gone. But here I am; I still have them. Mm, so unresolved, so, un, unresolved, can right. lead to a, a sense of desperation. Yes, well, it actually did lead to a sense of desperation. However, so what I decided. After that time, after I'm almost two years into it, I'm thinking I should be thinking about pain management because it does not appear anybody's got a solution for this. However, at the time, I was not aware of the little secret that the universe holds. And that secret is, how do you ever know when you're looking really hard for an answer in your life? You know when you often find it? Uh, at home. It's often at home when you're not looking for it. That is correct. Like Kansas. When stop, yeah. When you stop looking so darn hard, that's often when it comes. It's one of the little principles of the universe. So just two days after I decided I was not going to look for a solution to my pain, I was just going to seek pain management down the road, a friend came to me and said, you know what? I heard about this woman doing this incredible work. It seems like people go once or twice they come back and they have no more pain. I said, really? He said, yeah, really? I said, it sounds too good to be true. He said, well, what do you got to lose? Give it a try. I said, okay, where is she? Well, she was down in Hartford, Connecticut, mm -hmm. and she's a physical therapist. I said, great, so I call her up. Six months to get in to see her. Mm. So that was very disappointing because it meant at least six more months of excruciating migraines. But I took it as a good sign. If you've got a six-month waiting list, you're probably pretty good, right? Well, or at least a good marketer. Uh, or at least a good marketer. I like, I like that. That's true. Actually, let's, let's just pause for a second and invite our viewers and listeners. Uh, do you have an inventory of pain? And I mean your own internal pains uh, as opposed to the external ones. And consider creating a little inventory of that and checking in with us because Lee may be able to facilitate some of that and we may also address that in some of our pearls of wisdom coming up soon. Excellent. Uh, but the idea of now there's a, a, uh, a barrier to your perception of the cure for your problem. So then, and where do you go from that? How do you make lemonade out of six months of waiting? Exactly. So, you know, um, like I said, I, I try to look at the bright side of things. If you, I, I, that, that's what I was assuming. You got a six month waiting list. She's got to be the best ever, right? So that's what was going on in my head. Is it true or not? I don't know. So I got to the appointment and, you know, she does the exam like all the physical therapists do, very thorough, very professional. But this is where seemingly very strange things started to happen. Remember, I work in a physical therapy clinic. I kind of know the drill. And what I was about to see, I'd never seen before in my life. So she, she lied me down on a table on my back. And she took her hand and just started feeling around my neck and shoulder, feeling the tissue. Very, very gentle. I mean, so gentle, it was almost ticklish, like featherweight. And after doing that for a few minutes... She took my arm, and I'm still lying on my back, and she very slowly moved it into this position like this. But she, you got to admit, it looks kind of strange, right? <laughs> and she's holding it and holding it, and I'm thinking, what's going on here? It doesn't really feel like anything's happening. 
But I'm thinking, well, you know, we're just getting warmed up here. I'm sure she's going to get to the therapy pretty soon. And after holding it for a minute or two, she takes my arm, moves it, and puts it back down. And then she feels the tissue again. Again, very gentle, almost ticklish. And then she takes my head, and she moves it in this position, backwards and over to the side. And she's holding that. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I hope she realizes she's my, she's my last chance. I don't have a plan B here. And I hope we get to, to the bottom of this, because as far as I can tell, what she's doing is not going to fix anything. It's probably going to make me worse, because I'm getting a little upset, right? Because I remember to this day, 30 years ago, that appointment was $300 for 40 minutes. Totally worth it if my migraines would be gone. I'm pretty sure this is not going to do it. So, Howie, this goes on for about 40 minutes of putting my body in strange positions, which I now know is called positional therapy, which I'll explain a little bit later. And, and at the end, she goes, hey, you know what? I'm pretty sure your migraines were going to be gone. I was thinking, there's no way that therapy is going to take away my migraine. I barely felt it. It didn't even hurt. And it was so gentle, that couldn't have possibly fixed anything. But, you know, she was pretty convinced it was going to be gone. I was pretty convinced it wasn't. And I said, well, we'll see. You know, So a week went by, no migraine. A little unusual, but, you know, I'm pretty sure it's coming back any minute. I'm pretty sure that therapy didn't work. Two weeks, no migraine. Really unusual, but I'm still not convinced. When three weeks went by with no migraine, I got on the phone and I called her because I can't remember the last time I went three weeks. I said, what did you do to me? I don't have any migraine. She said, well, I know. I kind of told you that. She says, I did positional therapy. I said, can you kind of explain that to me? Because I had no idea what you're doing. And she, so she gave me the cliff note version. I said, wow, that actually makes sense to me. I said, I'm a therapist. Can I learn that? Because I want to help people like you help me. She says, oh, yeah, you can learn it. As a matter of fact, anybody can learn it. Anybody, even the guy in the street. She said, as long as they know the difference between an arm and a leg, they're good to go. You know, pretty mm. low bar. So I took that class, which was two days. I took it at the Osteo College in Biddeford, Maine. And I've been using it ever since. So this therapy is good for any muscular ache and pain that you have, mm. which is almost all the pain you'll have in your entire life, about 80 to 85% of all the pain you have in life is due to a muscular cause. Mm, let's pause on that for a second. Yes. Because uh, that's pretty profound. And uh, yes. I think it's worth uh, letting our viewers and listeners marinate on that. Because uh, viewers and listeners, think about that if you've already created some sort of inventory can you sense that there's muscles related to that? I know when Lee was showing his arm positioning, I believe some people may sleep like this, which is very interesting, yes. but it may be unilateral also and, and create other realms. I know for me, I have a whole different posturing here from sports, dentistry, neck surgeries, atrophies, arthritis, so even just doing that from one side to the other can be rather unique and not necessarily feeling therapeutic unless it's in the right hands. Yes. So, so that, that's an important distinction uh, for folks to get into the right hands. And I'm sure we'll touch base on how to develop the right hands. Uh, yes. And the concept of positional therapy and just as in yoga, our first pose is mountain, and it starts with the feet. And he, yes, hold on, I see a finger coming up from Amnon. He's positioned <laughs> something. I'm positioning you you my head. You showed us how you do it with your arms. Yes. Now, can you do it with your legs the same way? <laughs> you know, I showed that last week when we were doing that, and, and it was rather significant. So let no. me reach down. Oh, no, wait, no. I'll hold off for the end of the show. <laughs> Too much information. Don't want to show our little stage tricks here. All right, so positional therapy is the the revolution in a sense for you. Yes, that, that was the thing that changed the way I looked at body work. I, you know, I've been trained in all sorts of deep tissue techniques, uh, which are effective, don't get me wrong. 
Um, however, nothing that was long lasting. So the, the therapy that I developed here, which is called integrated positional therapy, because I put in a few other stretching techniques, which you know I'll explain, um, is a long-term solution to bring a body back into balance. Mm -hmm. So what we need to know to find out why this therapy is so effective is what is the root cause of most of our muscular pain in our body, like our tight necks, our tight shoulders, our sore backs? And the answer is a muscle imbalance. Mm. Now, a muscle imbalance is a very simple concept. It means the muscle is either too short or too long. Now, I think we, I'm going to do a little experiment here. So I'll, I'm going to show the audience on my body, but then we're going to have them do it on themselves. I'll have you do it too, so you can actually feel this. Okay. So, And we're going to do a pearl in just a moment. So, how, so think of, do you want to show the pearl first and then explain something? Yeah. Or do you want to yeah. show something now and then the pearl? Which do you yeah, prefer? Yeah, actually, why don't, we, why don't we do the pearl first? That would be All great. All right. So yeah. we're going to... Signal Amnon, pearl number one. Major imbalances in the pelvis that cause a great deal of pain in the body. The first one is an elevated pelvis. That simply means one hip is higher than the other. This is a very common condition. This also implies if one hip is higher, one leg is also shorter. This can lead to many aches and pains in the body, especially the knees and the back. To correct that, it's a matter of stretching a muscle in your low back here called the quadratus lumborum. To do that, you just sit in a chair. It can also be done standing up. And come over to one side until you feel a stretch in that muscle in the low back. Hold that stretch for about 30 seconds or a little longer. If this is too hard to have your hands up, it can also be done with your hands on your hips. Anything where you're feeling a stretch in the low back. Do that for about 30 to 60 seconds, then go to the other side. Do that one for 30 to 60 seconds as well. Doing that a couple times a day will make sure that your pelvis, if it's elevated, will start to go back to where it belongs. All right. Viewers and listeners, that's an elevated pelvis, not an elated Elvis. That's a whole different concept. Uh, now, it, it's also interesting we're talking about the pelvis, sort of the bowl or planter of the spine. But tell me about the roots and the feet. What, what is your uh, thoughts about that in terms of the rooting? Right. So the, so the way we look at it, the pelvis should be thought of as the basement of a house, the foundation of a house. If the foundation of a house is crooked, the entire house is crooked. So when your pelvis is crooked, everything above it is out of alignment, it's crooked, and everything below it is also out of alignment. So you know how, how a lot of people are getting hip and knee replacements these days. If everybody had a crook, a straight pelvis, there'd be very few hip and knee replacements. So in other words, when your pelvis is crooked, and there's three main ways, and the three pearls are going to deal with that, your hips and your knees do not bear weight the way they were designed. And anything that does not bear weight the way it was designed wears out quickly. Mm -hmm. It's like the axle on a car if, if, and the wear on your right. wheels and, and conversely back the other way. Exactly. The, I use that analogy all the time. The front end of your car is out of alignment. Your tires are going to wear out quickly. So our hips and knees are actually designed to last well into our 80s and 90s. And a lot of them are wearing out quicker simply because they're out of alignment, they're mm -hmm. crooked. Well, so let, let me go back to the muscle imbalance because this explains how it gets crooked. Sure. And I'm going to demonstrate up here in the chest area because it's easier to see and then we'll translate it down below. So, you know, we should all look like this, nice and open at the shoulders back, but most of us look like this to some degree. You know, that's from a lifetime of sitting in a chair that we tend, tend to end up looking like this. Mm. So when I did that, you can clearly see my chest muscles, they get pulled shorter, right? You see the two ends of the muscle? Yeah, the pectoralis. Yes. yes. But at the same time I'm doing that, muscles always work in pairs. So we got to think about what's going on the opposite muscle, which is between the shoulder blades. So if this gets shorter, 
you can kind of notice that muscle in the back gets longer, right? However, I can tell you, even though it's longer, it's not loose. So let's try this little experiment on ourselves. Mm -hmm. So everybody kind of just, just round your shoulders a little bit and really exaggerate. Get now crunchy. take a finger and poke your chest muscle. Now poke between your shoulder blades and tell me which one feels a little tighter. Uh, the back one. Yeah. For me. Yes, for, and that's true. For most people, it's going to be the one in the back. For some, it could be the ones in the front. But for mostly, it's going to be the ones in the back. Now, you just told me that's an overstretched muscle, and that's true of just about everybody. It's too long. Well, this is too short. So when people feel that pain back there, my clients tell me all the time, oh, I carry all my stress up here, you know, and it's true. But that doesn't tell you the cause of that, right? Right. So when most people feel that, the first thing they want to do is stretch it by doing something like this or doing some eagle arm pose. And that does make it feel better because you're bringing blood and oxygen. But the truth is you've actually now made it worse in the long run. You made it better in the short term and worse in the long run. So the truth is if you want to get rid of that, you actually have to stretch the short muscle make that longer, which then makes the long one shorter, brings it into balance, and the whole thing comes in the, out of pain. So if you do this, and then you poke it, when, now that you got good posture, you'll notice it doesn't hurt anymore. Well, it's, and it it's feeds into the concept that just because we perceive something doesn't mean that that's the truth, and we could yes. make a story about it, and that if I feel something, that that must be where the problem is, where often yes. in my experience and some others, that it's really referred from somewhere else. And tension in one spot is, is an expression of really some disparity somewhere else. Absolutely. Uh, and we just go to what seems to be the obvious, just like a shiny object. Whereas yes. even in working, or I've experienced people working with trainers, I avoid them because sometimes it's not clear what these actions are serving and even the proper mechanics of it for what's the point of this. And even when we're trying to stretch, well, do we really even understand what the stretching's about? And if it relates to yoga, is it really fostering breathing? Do people even understand prana? Exactly. Yeah, so, and so those are all very good key points. What I often tell my clients, where it hurts is typically not where it's coming from. So in other words, where it hurts is your symptom. The cause is typically the muscle on the opposite side of the body. So in that last example, when you hurt back here, that's your symptom. The cause are short muscles up here. And the solution is to stretch it. Mm -hmm. And even the yeah. distinction of understanding what is muscular pain, what is joint pain, or fascia, or neuro neurogenic origin and we can guess what it is but not necessarily fully understand what's going on i know when i had cervical joint disease mm -hmm. and my discs were degenerating and i was having pain in my shoulder socket and i went to an orthopedist and he felt that my shoulder socket was just fine maybe a hair of a little bit of calcification and mm -hmm. he was more focused on the location and, in my mind, missed the, uh, the root of the problem, which was the discs in my neck and the stenosis in the spinal column. Absolutely. So, you know, in our Western world, we're, we're great at treating symptoms. We're not so great at looking for the, the root cause. Mm -hmm. So I think your, your assessment was right on there. But even those degenerative discs, once the body comes into a line, they stop degenerating hmm. because it's typically from this head forward posture that starts to degenerate those discs. Oh, yes. And you throw some trauma in there and family yep. history. and. Yep. Yeah. Any, any stress or trauma will make all your muscles even tighter and make things even worse for sure. And, and what about your traumas? How, what have you experienced that has uh, influenced your journey? Yeah. So, you know, it's mostly those migraines from that, from those, from that headache. Since I've learned this technique, you know, I'm 66 now, I can tell you I'm, I'm pain-free. Um, and I only have to do, you know, 
little bit of 10, 15 minutes of stretching a day to, to maintain that. My wife is 71, also pain-free. Um, she does the stretches I give her. Again, no, no, none of these stretches are difficult, um, but they're all very important. You know, in the in three of the biggest ones are the are the three pearls that, you know, and we've already talked about one of them. Two more coming up, and the third and the fourth one, which we haven't talked about, and it's not one of the pearls, but we can make it a pearl. Is everybody should be stretching their chest at least three to four times a day. Well, since you brought it up, and since we don't have a recording of it, then yeah. let's just jump into pearl four as bonus pearl on the strand. Uh, tell me about the elbows. What are, you, what are your thoughts about elbow positioning relative to chest opening? Right, so, so if you know muscle anatomy, so these are called the pecs here, pec major and pec minor. And these, well, they all have different fibers that go in different directions. So in other words, where your elbows are is determine which aspect of the fibers you will be stretching. So we should be varying our elbow and arm position from day to day as we're stretching. So sometimes we should be stretching what they call cactus stretch. It kind of looks like a cactus, right? Mm -hmm. And you squeeze back like this. There you go. Yeah. Sometimes we can maybe have our arms straight out like this. Sometimes they should be a little lower like this. Sometimes the elbows can be in like this as well. So when you do that, you'll feel in the, you'll get a different stretch in those pec muscles. Mm -hmm. um, because to do the same stretch the same way every day leads to not the best result. We can right. get a better result by varying it. All right. So viewers and listeners, have you visited your feet periodically? Have you explored your hip positioning side to side? Give it a little shimmy. Stand up open the chest, take a little stretch break, because we're going to come to our sponsor spot this week. Our sponsor is You Call This Yoga. Hmm, where have I heard that name before? You Call This Yoga is a 501c3 nonprofit with a mission to help the physically challenged and underserved improve their life with yoga. It happens to be the organization that I founded in now direct. We have a beautiful board of directors that helps guide us and we produce events. Let's learn a little bit about our upcoming series of fundraising events in June. You Call This Yoga presents Yoga Fest Raleigh. Join us each Saturday in June for morning yoga classes in cool and fun locations. Vendors and activities may be on site too. Here is the Well-Fed Garden in West Raleigh, our location on June 17. Yoga Fest Raleigh supports free yoga in Southeast Raleigh at Chavis Park, Raleigh Teen Club, Brentwood Boys and Girls Club, and the Alliance Medical Ministry. Learn more and register today at etouches.com slash yfrawl2017. Improve balance with yoga. So, Lee, what do you think about that chicken's pelvis? How did that pelvis look? The chicken? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, to tell you the truth. <laughs> what I can tell you, most animals are pretty much aligned, whether it's a chicken, a cat, or a dog. Uh -huh. What gets us out of alignment the most, Howie, is actually the way we sit. So we were actually not designed to sit. Agreed. You know, cultures that squat don't have the issues that we have. So, you know, so speaking about sitting, you know, one, that's one of my things. What I determined in my 30 years of doing body work with people, I believe 50% of all the pain that I've treated came from a way a person sat. Mm. And, of course, the trick is to sit up as straight as possible. Now, it's, that's often not very easy to do because, you know, your muscles get tired from doing it. So I do recommend if people can put a little pillow or a little cushion in their low back, it, it makes a huge difference. So... 
you know, if I just had, you know, doesn't matter what you use, just a little something, and you stick it in the curve in your low back, that actually kind of keeps you aligned and makes it a lot easier. From a yoga viewpoint, I like to call this when I'm using this, seated, supported mountain pose. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because when you're in mountain, you're aligned. I call it, I... I tend to be more specific and take a towel or a blanket and roll it up and call a lumbar limbo roll because I'm trying to extend my tail under the bar yep. and extend my spine up in the plane of a roll or a conveyor roll. Sure. Uh, but that sense of fostering mountain pose, which does have curves in the spine that yes. are by intention as opposed to a rounded C shape, which tends to be our ladder positioning in life. Exactly. Even earlier in life. Uh, and that's why the feet position are so important. Uh, I've come to find also of raising the seat a little bit, especially because many chairs sag and foster pelvic tip. But I also wonder about people that have to spend so much time in a wheelchair. How do we, how do we foster them to have mobility as well as comfort since they're tending to be tip forward to be able to roll their wheelchair. How do you think we can help that? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, you know, a lot of stretches we do can all be done in a chair, for sure, whether it's a wheelchair or not. But, you know, I, I just did a program with um, Warrior Thunder Organization where we had the wounded veterans come and a lot of them were in a wheelchair. and. Um, sitting with them when I got a cushion in their back, but it's not just a matter of sticking a cushion. We got to be a little more precise. Mm -hmm. So what I tell them is to get a small pillow, roll it up, stick it back there. And you, you know, you kind of guess if it's too thick, it'll be uncomfortable. If it's too thin, your head's still kind of hanging out. When you make it thick enough to kind of bring the head over the shoulders and open this up, most of them felt an immediate, um, relief in their back and necks when we, when we got that cushion in their back. And it's just a matter of um, kind of playing with it until it feels right to them. Now, on my website, I got a free video of that. People can watch that as, as many times as they want, mm -hmm. which explains it in a little more detail. Would you cite the name of your website, please? My website is simply leealbert.com, L-E-E-A-L-B-E-R-T.com. Wonderful. And I noticed on the homepage of your website that you have a new book. Could you touch base about that? Yes, thank you. So my new book is called Yoga for Pain Relief, A New Approach to an Ancient Practice. Mm -hmm. So because I have 30 years of anatomy training and, and 23 years as, as a yoga teacher, I kind of was able to combine these two because I know yoga can do so many good things for people. And yet for some people, it didn't seem to work. And I, and I didn't know how to reconcile that. And then it finally dawned on me. So we should think of yoga on all the postures we do, the poses, as tools. So each tool, each pose, stretches and strengthens specific muscles. Mm -hmm. So if you end up doing ones that are too short, if you're stretching muscles that are too short in your body, you're going to get a good result. But if somehow you were stretching a muscle that was already too long, not knowing it was too long, you actually end up with a, a not such a good result. And maybe you even end up feeling worse sometimes. So from a, from a muscular viewpoint, what I've observed, most people have the muscles on the front side of their body mm -hmm. too short from a lifetime of city, which I call slumpasana from a yoga viewpoint. Right. Which me which means the muscles on the backside are now too long, except for the calves that are typically too short. So in my new yoga book, where I'm showing people how to, um, and, I, and I list specific conditions, how people can do upper body stuff, lower body stuff, if you've got these, I give specific flows for this. So basically what I'm doing, I'm stretching muscles on the front side of the body and stretching muscles, uh, strengthening muscles on the back side of the body. Mm -hmm. And when they do that consistently, typically in three to five months, if you do it often enough, you know, it's not that long, you can start to bring your body back in the balance. And when a body comes back in the balance, it starts to come out of pain. Mm. Wonderful. Well, viewers or listeners, teachers or students, any revelations on how you've created a balance in your muscles? 
The front body often is closed from our posturing and lack of attention to it. And often the back body, which theoretically is supporting the front, is just sort of hanging over. So consider for the moment where your feet are. Can you level your hips, open your chest, and take a few moments to get ready and view another pearl from Lee and his book, Yoga for Pain Relief. The second imbalance in the pelvis that leads to a great deal of pain in the body is a rotated pelvis. A rotated pelvis means one hip is further ahead than the other, it can be on either side. Many people present with this. This is due to some muscle imbalances in the pelvis. To correct this is a very simple procedure. Sit in a chair, cross a leg, and pull your leg over so you're feeling a stretch in this area here. Do that for 30 to 60 seconds. And then go and do the other side. None of these stretches should hurt when you do them. Pull over. So doing this maybe three to five times a day will start to take the rotation out of the pelvis and start to reduce a lot of pain in your body. I can appreciate that because as a dentist, I was leaning forward, torquing to the right, twisting up, nice. and that was just my hips. Mm. I had yes. my feet stacked so one foot was on the other ankle so I could pivot off the ball of my foot and torquing my neck to uh, get around someone. And that was on a good day. Yes. So, so my pelvis is still in this perpetual process of recalibrating because I feel one sit bone is higher than the other, and it's not because of the atrophy from my arthritic hip. Uh, yeah. There's just different positionings. Right. So it's, it's a chronic negotiation. I can testify for that. Sure. You know, and there are the three main pelvic imbalances, and you know, a lot of people may be thinking, oh, my pelvis isn't crooked. Well, I can tell you almost everybody is to some degree. If it's only out a little, then you really don't have many symptoms yet. But when it starts to get out more, and you know, and dentists and hygienists do have major imbalances from those positions you were describing, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, it's, but it's just a matter of doing the stretches three to five times a day for three to five months. It typically starts to bring it back. So when you're seeing clients, uh, my understanding is your, your main uh, base of treatment is at the Kripalu Center. Yes. And... Tell me about the, and our viewers and listeners, the, the clients that you see and, and how, how do they present and what, what is their makeup? Right. So, you know, I get a wide range of clients. Um, I've worked on people as, as young as six and as old as 97. And um, they come from all walks of life. Um, some are into yoga and some don't even know how to spell yoga. You know, but I, I've seen patterns as I've gone through, you know, I've worked at least 35,000 people in my 30 years. And the patterns I see, the number one complaint I work on is low back pain. It seems to be the number one complaint in the country. And the number two complaint is neck shoulder pain, which then also leads to headaches. Those, I'm going to say, comprise at least 50% of everything I work on. Mm. And how about ability to walk their ambulatory skills, how broad is that spectrum? Yeah, right. So most people come to me, do come in under their own power. I have some people who come in in wheelchairs, some who are on crutches, some who have canes. Um, but most of them do walk in on their own power here. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm curious because I see some of this in my classes. Uh, when mm -hmm. people have canes, yeah. uh, and you're a physical therapist, and I'm not. I just look at angles and, and postural and positioning. Uh, there seems to be quite a range of cane heights relative to the elbow and right. concepts of that. How disparate is that in the world, do you think? And do you make adjustments of that with your clients? 
Yes. So, so yeah, and cane height and size does make a difference. I've seen some people with canes is actually making their imbalance worse because it was so small, they would have to lean over to lean on it. Yeah. So, yeah, so that wasn't so good. But the way I look at it, my goal is to get them off the cane. Mm. So a cane is fine or crutches are fine as a short-term solution to give you extra support until which time we can get your body back in the balance and then you don't need that cane anymore. So, you know, I just had a client the other day and she came in with a great big walking stick. It must have been six feet high. And I'm thinking, you know, that was actually ideal because she could put her arm wherever she felt was just right there. Oh, yeah. I said, looks like you got that stick from Gandalf. Right. Oh, shall not pass. Right. Absolutely. So, you know, that, that was absolutely ideal. So, and she made it herself. So you can't, you can't beat that. Gosh. Well, that's an endeavor in itself. Yes. Do you ever find that uh, it's preferable to shift from a cane to a walker as a transition to go from one a unilateral to a bilateral sort yeah, of so, stabilization? You know, Yes, there's, there's oftentimes when walkers are very appropriate. It's better for balance, for one, for sure. So, you know, everything's an individual client, how much muscle strength they have, how bad are their imbalances, are their nerves being impacted. So there's a lot of decisions to be made in that. So a walker can will give you a lot more balance, will typically keep you a little straighter. However, again, you know, if possible, my goal would be to get them off the walker or the cane mm -hmm. and start, let's start using our muscles again. Because if we're on those things too much longer, that can cause some muscle atrophy as well. Mm -hmm. And actually, I, I was just about to get to that. I was with our uh, video producer uh, who helps me make the commercials, who was citing that he lost 10 pounds. And that was interesting because uh, he's younger than I and yes he went to a low sugar diet but he does an awful lot of sitting though he is out in the field and my question to him was well of that 10 pounds that you lost how much of it was desirable and how much is undesirable and is it atrophy from being a desk jockey as opposed to doing in uh, modes to improve muscle and bone density because as we age, our hormones are not stimulating the production of this. So just even being passive can lead to atrophy. Uh, and, and how do we address that? How, how is your bag of tricks for addressing atrophy? Yeah, great. So my bag of tricks is actually just common sense here. So as we get older, we tend to be less active, as you said. And when you're less active, your body's going to make less of those chemicals and hormones that it, that it needs. So the body is usually pretty efficient in the way it does things. So, you know, if you're in a hospital, you can see your muscles atrophy pretty quickly. Well, your bones are atrophying as well, except you can't see it. Because the body says, I'm not sending calcium to those bones. He doesn't need it. He's just lying there. I'm not going to waste the resources. Mm -hmm. So the more a person can move, you know, as, 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 when we were younger, we moved a lot more. So our body was making this stuff and making our bones strong, making our muscles strong. So I encourage everybody to move as much as they can. Um, you know, I, I have all sorts of clients. You know, they wake up in the morning, they drive to work, they sit all day at work, they come home, sit at their computer or TV, and go to bed, and then repeat it over and over. Oh, well, yes, yeah. You're going to end up with osteoporosis and muscle atrophy, and you're going to start to get weaker and it's about movement, you know, and walking is one of the best exercises you can do, simple walking. Uh-huh. Well, let's move on to that third pearl and figure out that other element of hip positioning. We've had side to side. We've had front to back. So let's see where else we can go. Low back pain is one of the number one complaints in the, in the country. And this third imbalance is the major culprit with that. And the third imbalance is a forward tilting pelvis. A forward tilting pelvis means the top part of your pelvis is moving forward like this. This causes compressions in the low back. 
And this is due to tight muscles in the front of your body called the hip flexors. Those muscles are your psoas muscle, which goes from here to here on both sides, and your big quad muscle here. They're pulling your pelvis forward when they get too tight. To correct that, we can sit in a chair. I'm going to turn this to the side a little bit. I'm going to come to the edge, and I'm going to move back this way. When I move my leg back, I'm stretching my quad muscle, and then I'm going to arch my back just a little bit and get a nice stretch in the psoas as well. Doing this three to five times a day will start to bring the forward tilt out of the body and you start to uh, have diminished back pain. After you've done one side, repeat on the other side. That looks pretty similar to seated runner stretch and even the development of seated warrior one pose. Yes, what and that's... A that's exactly what it is, Howie. So those are the muscles we need to be stretching. Because remember, every time we walk or run, we're making those muscles short and tight. And then when we sit, they go short and tight. So if everybody could stretch their quads and psoas, whether seated or standing, three to five times a day, um, that low back pain, which by the way, we spend $100 billion in this country every year on low back pain, we could cut that in half if everybody would do those, stretch those muscles every single day. Mm. And for those that are not as versed in anatomy as others, uh, could you explain a little bit more about where a psoas muscle sits and a little bit about a hip flexor and why they're right. important? Sure. So let, me, so let me start out with a little anatomy lesson. So every muscle has a name and every muscle has a job, which is called its action. So... When we say hip flexor, that's the action of some muscles. They flex your hip, which means they bend it forward, okay? There's two main muscles that do that. One is your quad muscle on your upper thigh. There's four quad muscles, but just one of them flexes your hip. And when it gets too short and your hip gets flexed forward, then your low back hurts. Now, the other hip flexor is called your psoas muscle. And that attaches to your spine, deep in your spine, starts right under, back up a bit, you will see, starts here and it comes all the way down into here on both sides. When it gets tight, it pulls you this way. And this is where you hurt. Mm. So everybody thinks they got a back problem when actually they got a psoas problem. So it's about stretching those guys open. Simple as this could be, or you can even get a little deeper once, you know, that feels more comfortable. Mm-hmm. So as muscle, it is a deep one. It connects to the spine, and then it connects also to the pelvis. To the pelvis. Mm -hmm. it, it actually attaches the upper and lower body. So, uh, People will know if they have a psoas problem, potentially, because if they go to a therapist and they massage in there, they'll know it when it's touched because yes. it's, it's a big ooh-ah. Yes, it is. It's pretty painful when it's being massaged. But that's why, you know, stretching it is so good. You don't need a therapist to release that for you. You stretch it three to five times a day. It's going to start to release, and it's not all that painful. And would you say that a seated stretch, as you showed, and a standing stretch, such as um, Warrior One, uh, would accomplish a similar result or do you have adaptations to make these more accessible? What do you yeah. like to say? Yeah, you will actually get a very similar result when you're doing a standing warrior one. You, you can go deeper, but I'm never a big fan of a very deep stretch. Um, here's, here's a statement I'll give you. In my book, I actually give a whole chapter on how to stretch because mm. that's very important. So humans, that would be us, Howie, humans are the mm. only species that stretch in the pain. Now that implies we're either smarter than the other species or you can kind of fill in the blanks there, right? Mm -hmm. You see dogs and cats stretch. They look happy when they stretch. It's never very deep. When I'm stretching my clients on the table, it's such a little stretch, they hardly feel that I'm stretching. And yet they see their body changes right before their eyes. So the truth is, if you stretch too deeply, you elicit what we call this, a very strong stretch reflex. So this is the body's protection mechanism. It's afraid you're going to rip it in that deep stretch. It starts to contract 
deeply against your deep stretch, and you actually don't get very far for all your effort. So I'm asking people to do less work for a better result. Mm-hmm. And it's and the thing about a stretch is is that there's uh, an origin and an extension. And I, and I find, especially with the shoulder blades and opening yeah. the chest, that if you focus on the lower middle corner of the shoulder blade, I label that as the uh, base, and everything yeah. else from there flows. So one could lift their arm more readily if they're engaging their shoulder blade and with more integrity as opposed to rooting it from the shoulder socket and inviting their rotator cuff to start tearing. That's absolutely true. So, you know, by isolating muscles, we get into trouble. We need to recruit them all and work together. So when most people have shoulder issues, it's from, you know, being too rounded forward here. With rounded forward here, these there's these all these rotator cuff muscles and the other supporting muscles get limited range of motion. So what I recommend for people with shoulder, um, who have less than ideal mobility in their shoulder, is to stretch their chest three to five times a day. Mm -hmm. Like we were talking about the fourth pearl. And when we start to look like this all the time, because if we keep stretching here and strengthening back there by squeezing the shoulder blades, you'll get better range of motion in your shoulders fairly quickly. Because this brings, this shoulders rounded forward is a rotator cuff out of balance. Mm -hmm. When you're like this, the rotator cuff starts to come into balance. When it's in balance, there's better range of motion. I have a uh, swag shirt from my daughter at UC Berkeley, and across it says California. And I wore it to a therapy session, uh, another kind of therapy. It was called gyrotonics. And her reference, which is still exactly in the same plane, as you are about opening that, is we talked about opening the C and the A in the California. So I use that as a reference now uh, in my teaching of, well, let me see your whole California and not just Ali Forney. And people go, what is Ali Forney? And well, that's what you're showing me as opposed to California. Excellent. And another one of my obtuse references, but that's showbiz, what can I say? Yeah, no, that's perfect, because that says it all right there. And, so the uh, bottom line, how if you know we can get our bodies straight by stretching muscles up front, strengthening in the back a little bit, not a lot of work, you, there's no need to be bent over when you're older. You could be straight as an arrow at 70 or 80. And when you are, you'll not only look younger, you'll have far less pain in your body. Right, more energy flow, better oxygenation. Yes. yes. Digestive capacity. I can't make any promises for anyone. Uh, but in terms of also promise, uh, we promised to talk about some of where you're teaching and some of the programs. How could people learn more about ITP? Great. Or IPT, well, actually. Yes. Very... So um, let's see my next, I have a yoga program coming up the weekend of June 2nd to the 4th at Kripalu Center in Lenox, Massachusetts. It's called Structural Yoga Remedies, where I show people how to identify long and short muscles in their body, and then we craft a practice from that. So we'll be doing yoga the entire weekend, gentle yoga, suitable for all levels, from beginner to advanced teachers. And by taking this approach, we start to train the body to come back into balance quickly. Mm. And I'm also doing a program at Kripalu November 3rd, it's called Integrated Positional Therapy. And this is a class open to anybody from MDs to moms and dads, which is also MD, right? Mm -hmm. and, the, and the only difference is, um, if you're not a licensed professional, you may only use these techniques on yourself, your friends, and your family, which is pretty valuable, because you're going to learn how to take care of your body. If you're a licensed professional, you'll be putting it into your practice immediately. So, and you can find out about those classes on my website. Again, it's leealbert.com. You can click on the links and get more information on those classes. Time to time, I do other classes around the country. So check my website. You'll, you'll see where I'm showing up. And I did see on your website something about find 
other positional therapists who have been mentored or trained by you. Uh, yes. How's the distribution of that overall? Are they more focused in a region of the country or are there more mini leads out there? Yeah. Yeah. So there's uh, we just started our certification process. So we, I am starting to certify people. Uh, it's a pretty rigorous process because you know, I want them to know what I know. I'm not going to just say you, you kind of know this. No, you got to really know it. So we started to roll this out a couple of years ago. So because you know, I'm in the Northeast, we're mostly concentrated in the Northeast, but it, I do have s some people up and down the East Coast. Um, so that's why I ask people just to email me on my website and I'll let you know if I have anybody in your area. Right now, I have nobody west of the Mississippi, but I'm, sure, I'm soon to have one in California who will be certified this year. Wonderful. And when you're doing um, these programs at Kripalu, do people register through you or do they go through the Kripalu website? Yeah, they're going to they're gonna go to the Kripalu website. So if they go to my website and click on the link, it'll take them to the Kripalu website with the explanation, the pricing, and how to register for all that. Wonderful. And viewers and listeners, how I came to meet Lee is from my chair yoga teacher, Lakshmi Volka, Volker, who has partnered with Lee in advancing some of her chair yoga techniques and his perspectives, I suspect, in yoga as she has proceeded in her 30 plus years of teaching. So together, they've been a wonderful uh, synergy in my perspective of how chair yoga is shared in the world. Uh, I suspect that there's ways that chair yoga can be taught differently because there's many different chairs and we all come from different perspectives and experiences. But I suspect that by blending modalities and Lee and Lakshmi have, that they've created an enhanced perspective. I encourage you to visit Lakshmi and Bruce's website, getfitwhereyousit.com, as well as Bruce, bleh, Lee at leealbert.com to see how your positioning while seated and standing can enhance your health and comfort. Lee, other little tidbits that you'd like to share or practices that come to mind that foster comfort? Yes, absolutely. So one of the biggest ones, and you know, I have a chapter in my new book on this one, it's about stress. Stress is, is really our, the biggest epidemic in this country. And everybody's under it to some degree. And stress means you're, you're in fight or flight. Your body's making adrenaline and cortisol and all sorts of chemicals you really don't want because it doesn't make you feel good. So we have, a whole, we have one whole chapter on breathing, which in yoga is called pranayama. And it's one simple health breath that I'll, I'll leave with your, your viewers here. And the trick of this breath is to have the exhale twice as long as the inhale with a little hold in the middle. So I'm gonna, I'll demonstrate it's what I call a four, four, eight breath. But if that's too, too, too hard on the person's lungs, we, it's more about the ratio. It could be three, three, six, or two, two, four. So the breath is very simple and it's always through the nose. And I do this lying in bed at night because there's always time at night, right? So you breathe in through your nose for four. You hold for four. And you exhale for eight. Now, science has shown us 10 minutes of that breath will take anybody out of fight or flight. And, and when you're out of fight or flight, you're in what we call rest and digest. So if you have digestive problems, it's, and so many people do, it's because you're in fight or flight. When you're running away from a predator, it's not the time to digest, you see? Mm -hmm. So we can get ourselves into, into rest and digest in 10 minutes of this breath. It's an ancient yogi breath. The yogis all knew it, that what this did to their body. They didn't have the science to explain it. Science now confirms you're going to start making good chemicals like serotonin and GABA and oxytocin and all sorts of things that are going to make you feel good and happy. So if we can all get a little breathing practice every day, 10 minutes, while you're lying in bed, it'll start to change your life. Mm. 
Well, that is a beautiful cherry for our Sunday on positional therapy. Uh, I can testify that I do my breathing to help fall asleep too. And if I breathe like that for 10 minutes, well, I wouldn't be awake. So (laughs) I also suggest as a calming parasympathetic option, viewers and listeners, you can cut down the the, uh, quantity. You can consider a... uh, an eight four if you're t- skilled or a four to two just something simple that you're not straining and that you can let your body settle we'd like to thank lee for sharing his time and expertise and encourage our viewers and listeners to check out leealbert.com yoga for pain relief visit the Kripalu website to visit lee's programs we also like to thank you call this yoga our educational nonprofit for hosting our show. Consider visiting their website, youcallthisyoga.org, for information about our programming, as well as our events coming up in June, Yoga Fest Raleigh to help programs in Southeast Raleigh. Thank you, Lee. It's been a joy to have you, and I look forward to sharing more with you. Thank you, Howie. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you, too. Namaste, everybody. You're tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.